we are going to be talking about taking wood to the next level, CLT as a floor and roof element. And this presentation is copyrighted by American Wood Council. We have the description and learning objectives for all of you that um, to include in the PDF. Hopefully you've had some time to download the PDF and Brian is providing a link for all of you to download that if you have not. So Marcy, let's do the first poll. Absolutely. So this one, we just want to know who you are. So um, are you an architect, engineer, code official, work for the fire service, or building manufacturer or other? So um, all of you have great um, experience to bring to this webinar, and we're so glad that you're here. So, and as usual, I usually give about 30 seconds or wait for about 80%, and I have both of those. So I'm going to go ahead and close. And then we've got 68% engineers, 15% code officials, and 8% building manufacturers, others, 7% architect, and 1% fire for service. So thank you so much for being here, and we hope that you find something of value. Great, yes, thank you. Looks like we've got a large concentration of engineers. Now we have one more poll. And this poll, we're interested to find out where you're located throughout the US. Um, so we have the color coded with the west in purple, north central in green, which is in this location, northeast in brown, the southeast in teal, and the south central in yellow. And so, once you find that, Marcy will launch the poll. We're just giving you a little bit of time so you can see where you are geographically. And then we have Alaska and Hawaii also on the west. Unfortunately, we're limited in polls. Otherwise, we would have added something um, such as outside of the US. But we are only allowed to have five uh, answers. So let's launch that poll. All right, here we go. So let us know where you're from. Those are quick answers. <laughs> they sure are. Oh, and this is awesome. We are spread across um, the United States. So, and I'm sure we have some folks from, from outside of the United States too. And you are as, just as welcome as the United States. So, <laughs> um, If you are outside of the US, you could put it in the question or Oh, chat perfect. Box. Good idea, Michelle. If you'd like to. All right. It'd be here, if, great if you're like from Japan or Jamaica or. And wherever. we often have one or two international folks, so it, I'm I'm always excited to see those folks. So, all right, I'm right. going to go ahead and close. We almost have equal representation, so I think we do. So, yeah, very much so. Southeast, not so much. Um, which is interesting because we're, you know, Virginia out here, we're part of the Southeast. So, um, yeah. Actually, Equal according to the map, it's part of the Northeast. Oh, are we? I didn't look <laughs> at the map. Oh, my goodness. All right. <laughs> okay, we have one more poll. Okay. Um, this is to give an, a, us an idea of the makeup the, of the audience. So let's go to the next poll, and this one can be launched immediately. All righty. How from, oh, I'll let you go ahead and say it. Sure. Either way, how familiar are you with CLT? Are you a guru? Design, do you design or review many CLT projects and can teach the class? Are you a craftsman? Design, have you designed or planned, reviewed many projects with CLT? Are you an apprentice? You're familiar <laughs> with CLT, but you haven't designed or reviewed any projects. You're a novice, just started learning about CLT. Or what? What is CLT? All right. All right. This is really good feedback, and I really appreciate that you're participating in this poll. Because it helps this. as I, uh, how much detail I provide. OK, I'm going to go ahead and close this. OK, great. And let's see. So we're about right in the middle. We've got lots of apprentices. Um, so 40% are familiar, but don't have design or review um, experience. So. Good. 
Well, excellent. Thank you very much for participating in that poll. And for those of you that are gurus, I'm going to hand over the speaker to you so you can teach the class. No, I'm just kidding. So, um, but it's good to see we've got some apprentice novice. So this presentation is really good because it provides a really good overview of mass timber, CLT, um, and then I'll get into the outline right now. To give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about is we're going to give you an overview of building examples that utilize not only CLT but other types of mass timber construction. And then we'll get into the building code, the standards, AWC standards that are utilized for designing with cross laminated timber. And then we'll get into an actual design example where we'll not only design for structural, but we'll also design for fire resistance. And then after that, we'll have Adam from who is presenting on behalf of CWC to talk about the woodwork software. And then after that, this is a really exciting time in our building industry where we are being really innovative and expanding the use of wood. And we'll look at current code happenings related to mass timber. And then we'll finally end up with resources that may be available for you for free. A lot of them are for free. And then end up with some Q&A at the end. So hold on tight and we'll be ready to go. So most of you are probably familiar with a contemporary, some people call it conventional stick frame construction. You drive around town and you probably see a lot of this. Um, this in particular pictures are showing mid-rise construction, but that's what we would call just stick frame nickname, stick frame construction. And then um, I actually was with Woodworks before joining AWC. I joined Woodworks in 2008 and mass timber was something that was relatively new to the US. And um, this was under construction when I joined and it co was completed in 2009, January 2009. And at that time, it was the tallest mass timber building made entirely of CLT construction from, um, well, there's a concrete podium, one level of concrete podium and then eight stories of CLT. So that was back in 2009. And then most recently, uh, our Canadian buddies up north are have completed Brock Commons, which is a van, in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada, which is seven stories of cross laminated timber over one level of concrete podium. And it's a mixed use student housing. It was completed in September 2017. But what's interesting about this, other than it's being very innovative is that it uses cross laminated timber as the floor system and glue laminated timber columns. And uh, uh, this was very timely in that it really helped with the code change process that I'm going to talk about at the very end of the presentation related to the 2021 codes. Um, you'll note that this is an 18 story building. We have uh, been adopted into the 2021. Well, I won't um, I'll get into that too much deeply, but remember 18 stories when we talk about the code changes. And this project, uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to tour this building, one of these buildings. It's three eight story construction of residential condo townhomes and rental units. And one of at least one of the buildings is complete. It's in Quebec, Canada, the Abora and it is when completed, it will be the largest mass timber construction in the world that's going on right now. They have actually, if you Google this, you can see a webcam of it being under construction. And then now taking it from Canada to the US, here are some of the firsts that are going on in our country back in 2015 before it was even adopted in the 2015 IBC. This project was built, the first elementary school using cross laminated timber, all of cross laminated timber in West Virginia, Franklin, West Virginia. And then we have the first hotel that was built in 2016 was completed and the Redstone Arsenal, Huntsville, Alabama. I know this, uh, and this was um, by Len Lease. They just recently completed another hotel hotel in upstate New York. Uh, similar uh, design, and uh, but a little bit larger using cross laminated timber. 
And the Pacific Northwest is an area where it's really taking off using cross laminated timber construction. This is one example. It's the Albania, Albania Yard. I'm probably saying that incorrectly. Uh, Portland, Oregon. Four stories of cross laminated timber, which is combined office and retail, which was completed in 2016 using cross laminated timber construction and cross glue laminated timber beams and columns. And then recently in 2018, in the summer of 2018, this is the tallest cross laminated timber or mass timber construction in the US. Eight stories, but it's at 85 feet. And the luxury condominiums, uh, the first floor is commercial with residential above, 42,000 square feet called Carbon 12. And they have subterranean parking. The parking's quite unique, but not to this. Um, but if they have, uh, if you Google it, you can see more information on this project. And it utilized buckling restraint frames for its vertical lateral resisting system, which was the core lateral resisting system. And then the diaphragm is cross laminated timber. So now that we've seen some examples of cross laminated timber and mass timber construction, we'll look at where the code has incorporated it into the body of the code and adopted it. This presentation, the baseline will be on 2018 IBC. And for those of you that are not familiar with cross laminated timber, here's a, a picture of it, one picture of it, that shows um, some people nickname it jumbo plywood. But it was uh, the first patent for cross laminated timber occurred in 1985 in France. And then projects were built in Switzerland and Germany in 1993. They've made some improvements to the press technology. And even as early as 2000, they see an increase, or there was an increase in cross laminated timber use in mid rise, low rise buildings um, to support the green building movement because of the storing, carbon storing capabilities of mass timber construction or wood construction, how it is, acts like a sink and stores carbon for long term storage, takes that out of the atmosphere and stores it in its body. And um, oh, just in England, there are over 500 cross laminated timber buildings. And then recently, relatively recently, it's migrated to US and Canada. But we're really seeing, and I'll show you a map in the end of the presentation towards the end, about what is going on throughout the nation with mass timber construction. So similar, many of you are probably familiar with glue laminated timber beams where we have laminations. Each of these is a lamination. With, this one is showing a graphic of an equal layup where you have the same species of wood at the top and the bottom and then it varies in species throughout the depth but it's equally balanced and it has the laminations all in one direction so it spans in the major axis. Well similarly cross laminated timber has layers of laminations but the laminations are 90 degrees to that. And you can see that it, this would be the long direction where the laminations, the highest strength probably are going to be laid up where the highest strength of lumber is in the outer laminations and spanning in the long direction. And then 90 degrees to that, we have the other lamination spanning in the minor axis. So this provides dimensional stability and you get two way action because of this cross lamination. And so to give you an idea of the manufacturing of cross laminated timber, we've incorporated a video into the presentation. Let's see how this works.
Okay, great. So that was to give you a flavor of what the manufacturing process is. Obviously, each manufacturer may have their own different process, uh, but the main idea is that you have the laminations. Each of the laminations are laid out. Let me stop this. Are laid out, and then adhesive is applied to the flat side of the wood members. Um, you notice also, though, that at each of the edges, there is no adhesive applied to the edge of the wood members. And Lori will probably bring that up when she talks about wall action of CLT panels, um, which will be our webinar coming up in a few months. But um, in addition to that, um, when we look at the code and how it was introduced into the code, it's good to understand the manufacturing process and to introduce it into the code, a lot of research was provided to support the inclusion of cross laminated timber into the code. One of those, inf one information, when they look at the evaluation of a product, whatever product is, wood or steel or concrete, they wanna look at its fire resistance and is it capable to resist fire and as well as structural. Well, to support the information or support the product related to fire resistance, a fire test was performed. There are a couple of reports that are out there. One is by FP Innovations, uh, NRCAN, that did a fire test in 2012. And then also American Wood Council did a fire test back in 2012 to support and substantiate the use of cross laminate timber and adoption into the code. And this shows you the test uh, by American Wood Council was an ASTM E119 fire test, endurance test, uh, which is quite common. And it was five ply CLT, which is about seven inches thick, and five eighths type X gypsum on each side. Um, in the middle of the panel, you can see here's a panel, the panel is here, and then the other panel is there. There was a half lap in the middle, which was uh, connected together with self-tapping screws. The fire endurance that was sought was two hours, and we ended up with three hours and six minutes. And the only reason why it was stopped was because there was, uh, part of the panel was caught on fire here. Um, you can see some flames. And when they pulled the drywall off though, there was no other damage to the panel and, and the temperature, of you could touch it, the panel with your hand. Um, the other thing to point out is even though the fire test was stopped, the applied load, the vertical load at the top of the panel, 87,000 pounds was applied during the test and it still withstood that 87,000 pounds. In other words, it was structurally safe. So in the 2015 IBC, that's where CLT was first adopted under the heavy timber construction. And we incorporate cross laminated timber in heavy timber construction. And also we incorporate structural composite lumber. Now heavy timber construction or type four construction is that type of construction with exterior walls of non-combustible materials and interior of solid or laminated wood without concealed spaces. The heavy timber members are, have large cross sections and achieve slow burning characteristics that made it really common back in 1800s in heavy industrial areas, such as the Northeast. And it's because of this inherent resistance to fire, in other words, when exposed to fire, it chars, and that charring slows down the advancement of the fire. So it slows down the time. And then the inner core of that wood member is still structurally sound and uh, stays structurally sound to prevent any sudden collapse. So given this long history and uh, wood's inherent ability to provide fire resistance is where we get heavy timber construction, type four construction. And you, when, you see the different types of construction, maybe engineers aren't as familiar, but with the tables in the code, but you have five types of construction, type one through type five. Heavy timber construction provides larger square footage, a bigger building than type 2B construction. Type 2B is known to be concrete or steel, but with heavy timber construction, you can provide a larger building or a large larger building is allowed 
under heavy timber construction than type 2B and almost equivalent to type 2A. And 2B is unprotected, whereas 2A is protected. So something to think about when working with the architect or when the architects are choosing the type of construction is look at the advantages that can be gained by using heavy timber construction. Now in the 2018 IBC, we see a clarification of the language in that, if you recall, I mentioned that heavy timber construction is exterior walls, non-combustible, and interior of solid or laminated wood without concealed spaces. Well, they've clarified the language in 2018 IBC to state that the building elements are of solid wood, laminated wood, heavy timber or structural composite lumber without concealed spaces. So clarifying an inclusion of more wood products in the language. And there are minimum sizes that the heavy timber structural members need to be. Previously in the 2015 code, this table or a partial portion of this table was in chapter six, but sometimes engineers don't go to chapter six and so they've moved the table to chapter 23, where it should be with the wood chapter, chapter 23, and they've expanded the table to be a little bit more descriptive. So the previous table just provided sizes, and now the new table in 23 provides what, what is it supporting, parameters for what loads are it supporting, and then the actual heavy timber structural elements defining it. And then in the body of the chapter 23, it has specific information related to minimum thickness of the cross laminated timber panels. So this is for solid sawn lumber, glue laminated timber, and structural composite lumber. So under heavy timber construction, the exterior walls, as I mentioned, need to be non-combustible, but there is also an inclusion for, in addition to non Combustible, you there's an exception to use either fire retardant treated wood or six inch uh, CLT sheath with 1532nd fire retardant treated wood structural panel plywood or half inch gypsum um, in in the walls that are less two hours or less. So the entire building can be of cross laminated timber, the walls, the floors, and the roof. And then under type three construction, type three construction requires non-combustible materials on the exterior walls and any permissible material on the interior. So now that CLT is in the code, adopted in the code, it would qualify as any permissible material. And we can have the entire interior of the building, the floors, the interior walls out of cross laminated timber and the exterior walls it can include non-combustible non material or fire retardant treated wood where the exterior walls are two hours or less. And then type five construction is not just wood construction. It specifically states it's any materials permitted by the code. So cross laminated timber can be used for type four, three and five construction. I guess three, four and five to put them in order the entire building for type five construction. So let's have another poll. Yes, let's do. So which of the following is correct? 2015 IBC included CLT for the first time. CLT can be used in type three, four and five construction. Heavy timber construction includes GLT, CLT and SCL. All of the above or answers A and B. And if you don't get a chance to vote, it is not a big deal. So this does not contribute toward your certificate at all. And I do have to cut these short because we have a, a lot to get through. So let's see, 71% said all of the above, 24% answers A and B. And Michelle, the real answer is? Great, so the real answer is very similar to what we got last webinar isn't it? So yes, all of the above. Uh, it was first adopted for the first time in the 2015 IBC and then it can be used in type 3, type 4, and type 5 construction 
And then heavy timber construction includes glue laminated timber, cross laminated timber, and structural composite lumber. And the other thing that I want to point out is on heavy timber construction, type four construction, as long as the wood members meet the minimum sizes that are specified in that table in chapter 23, no additional fire protection is required. And I'll bring this back up when we talk about calculating fire resistance by calculating the char depth. That is something totally different from heavy timber construction. I'll mention again later on in the presentation. So what are the standards that we use for designing with cross laminated timber? Well, the IBC references the 2018 NDS. And the 2018 not only incorporates cross laminated timber, but it also incorporates sawn lumber, glue laminated timber, and structural composite lumber. And I bring this up because all of these are used in mass timber construction. Um, struck, sawn lumber would be something that you would use for nail laminated timber, where you have two bys that are vertically erected and then nailed all together to create one flat plate. Uh, but mass timber construction is not defined currently in the code, but it's used now in the industry to describe large buildings that use plate uh, solid wood construction. And under the 2021 code changes uh, that are currently going on for structural, the non-structural have already gone through, Group A, we're working on Group B now, the new definition for mass timber construction will be included as a code change to define mass timber. But mass timber can include nail laminate timber, it can include glue laminate timber, it can include glue laminate timber installed flatwise. I've seen a building where it's installed flatwise to create one big plate of, and then structural composite lumber and of course CLT. So CLT is in with our product chapters. We added uh, or changed chapter 10 to cross laminated timber so that we could keep our, all our wood products together. And this is important to note in that for design procedures in this reference, in the NDS and reference design values, the assumption is that all the CLTs are manufactured using ANSI, under the ANSI, a, ANSI APA PRG 3 tonny provisions. So if it, you get a CLT panel that's not manufactured you, under these provisions, then NDS, you would not be able to use NDS for the, it wouldn't be designed per the NDS because it's manufactured under some other standard. Uh, then the, this is a picture of the reference design standard, which is the specific addition that's referenced is the PRG 320 2017, which also references the ANSI AITC 405-2013. And there is a 2018 version that's available, and that incorporates some adhesive requirements to prevent the re fire regrowth. That means when it burns, it could, and then it's starting to go out, it can regrow. So to prevent that, it, the adhesives are now uh, been updated and they are in the PRG 320-2018, um, which references an ANSI AITC 405-2018. And what it occurred is the standards, the NDS standards, there's a deadline of December 1st, 2017 to have it all completed. And the standards, the uh, performance rated CLT standards didn't come out till February of 2018. So that's one reason why it wasn't adopted into or referenced in the NDS. We couldn't reference it because it wasn't publicized. So in the 2021 IBC, it will be referenced uh, under the, for the 2000, we'll be referencing the 2018. Okay, all wood products, when you um, get them out to the job site, we wanna make sure that they are have the correct product stamping uh, or marking. Here's an example of a product marking that pretty much tells you where it came from, 
who milled it, what grade it is, how thick it is, and the approving agency. This one happens to be a V2 grade and six and seven eighths thickness. This is the mill. And also important is the manufacturing standard, the ANSI APA PRG 320. For the 2018 NDS, this should say 2017. Um, but one other stamp in addition to this may be stamping it as top. I mentioned earlier about the glue laminated timber having a balanced layup where you have the same laminations top and bottom and throughout the depth of the glue laminated timber. Well, glue laminated timber can also be specified as unbalanced where if it's simply supported, you need your highest species of wood on the bottom and you don't necessarily need it on top. So for making it a um, less costly glue laminated timber, some may specify an unbalanced condition. The same could be true for cross laminated timber. It's not as common, but you could have an unbalanced layup. And in that case, it should be marked as top so that they know when they go, they're uh, erecting these CLT panels, they install them correctly. And the dimensions, minimum dimensions or maximum dimensions for the cross laminated timbers, the laminations, the individual laminations are 5 eighths to 2 inches of sawn lumber or structure composite lumber. And the overall thickness is 20 inches max. And then we have in service moisture content of 16%. That's what's assumed when you analyzing or designing these cross laminated timber and it's very similar to glue laminated timber at 60% moisture content. And let's see, the other thing to be aware of in chapter 10 is where do we get our design values? Um, for sawn lumber and glue laminated timber we go to our, um, oops, sorry. Well for cross laminated timber where we go is we go to the the manufacturer's literature or code evaluation report to get our reference design values. Since it is a proprietary product, each manufacturer may have different capacities for their product. And one very good resource to get some information on cross laminated timber is APA, the Engineered Wood Products Association. This is a screen capture of their web page on cross laminated timber. You can see over on the right hand column where we have CLT manufacturers. These manufacturers are members of APA. And then we also have product reports that are shown here. And the product reports, as I mentioned, can come from the actual manufacturer of the CLT or a product report. This gives you an example of a product report. And I want to make a distinction in that there are three, you can get the product report from APA, you can get an ER report, sometimes that's ICCES, or you can get a combined report between APA and ICC. There's an agreement to do that. So three different types of reports that may be available for the wood products. Okay, and when we design cross laminated timber, we get our applicable adjustment factors similar to other wood products. There are applicable adjustment factors and shown here, depending on what mode of uh, design you're looking at, if you're looking at the flexure, the compression, or the shear. And this table is similar to what you would see for a wood structural panel that has different laminations, different layups, uh, cross laminations, I mean. And so let's go with another poll. Absolutely. So cross laminated timber has laminations of 5 eighths inch to 2, eight, two inch thick, laminations of sawn lumber of SCL, laminations all oriented in one direction, all of the above or answers A and B. People were listening. So with that, I'm going to close. And 84% say answer E, answers A and B. So, wow, this is better than last time. Yeah. They are listening. Wow, you guys are awake. Okay, yes, the answer is A and B. And just to give a graphic to 
this. Uh, the incorrect answer was laminations all oriented in one direction. And as mentioned, the laminations, this gives you the graphics. We have laminations on the outer layer in this direction. The next layer, the laminations are in this direction and et cetera. So awesome. Glad to see the results. And then in the NDS, AWC's National Design Specification for Wood Construction, I should have mentioned that in the beginning, it, Chapter 12 includes now information related to CLT connections, spacings related to connecting into the edge, panel edge or end, and then the face of the panel, providing spacing requirements, uh, also related to withdrawal of connectors, all that, all that type of information related to designing a connection. Now, a lot of the CLT panels or projects out there are using self-tapping screws, which are proprietary type connectors, um, but you could use the spacing requirements that are require, are um, laid out in the NDS. And they use, I should have had a picture, but using self-tapping screws and angles to connect the panels together. And I believe some of the connector manufacturers have or will be coming out with connections, prefabricated connections for connecting cross laminated timber. The last piece or one of the last pieces to the puzzle is we, we're incorporating vertical loads. What about lateral loads? What can we do with cross laminated timber? Well, certainly in wind governing areas, cross laminated can be used for in plane diaphragms and possibly shear walls, although the wind and seismic provisions don't include shear wall capacities for using CLT for shear walls. We're looking at that right now to include it in uh, the 2021 wind and seismic provisions, but right now we are not. You'd have to get that information from the manufacturer. Sorry, I move forward. But for seismic, that can be a challenge in the high seismic areas because one, there's no response modification coefficient. We know if you're familiar with seismic design, this is one of the, co the factors that is involved with figuring out what our criteria is for designing for seismic. There is research going on and there is hope that it will be incorporated in ASC 722. Um, perhaps it may be three and four. I know that there are engineering firms that are utilizing cross iron timber and they're using an R of one or two, which is something that would come out of the cross laminated tuner timber handbook, although that is not a codified document. But it's a really good document to get additional information about cross laminated timber. So the CLT is not recognized as a prescribed system in ASC 7, in other words. But there are tools available for you to utilize cross laminated timber, and which are listed here. You can do the performance-based design procedure per ASC 7, or demonstrating an equivalency to an existing ASCE 7 system, or ASCE 716 FEMA incorporating it with FEMA P95 or FEMA 7, P795, um, and then component equivalency methodology. Now, a lot of the buildings, out, not a lot, I shouldn't say a lot, but I've seen buildings where they use cross laminated timber as the diaphragm and the walls, but their vertical lateral resisting system is a prescribed vertical lateral resisting system in from seven ASC seven, such as buckling restraint uh, brace frames or a moment frame, some system that's already incorporated in ASC seven. And there are ways to um, do buildings out of this mass timber construction. Okay. The last piece of the puzzle that we're going to talk about today is the fire resistance. And I mentioned heavy timber construction, if the wood members meet the minimum requirements that are specified in the table, meet those sizes, no additional fire protection is required. Uh, there was an exception to that in that um, it specifically stated that if it's used, for example, cross laminate timber is used in the exterior wall where gypsum was needed to to be added, but other than that case, the where 
mass timber. It's categorized as heavy timber construction, no additional fire protection, and no additional calculations is required to validate wood to be used under type heavy timber construction, type four. So we're gonna be talking about calculating char. And this is a case where you have, say a type five or a type three construction and the architect would like to see the glue laminated timber beam or the cross laminated timber panel to be exposed. However, the code requires it to have one hour fire resistance or two hour fire resistance. That's where you can calculate the amount of char depth to build into your wood member to provide that one hour or two hour. Now you can do this for columns, beams, and it should say panels also, cross laminated timber, glue laminated timber, sawn lumber, and decking. And this is adopted, or it's uh, specified in chapter seven of the IBC, calculated fire resistance, and it specifically references the national design specification, chapter 16. So this is an example of glue laminated timber beam that's been exposed on all four sides. And when it's exposed to fire, we know it burns, that it does burn. And then it, as that char is created, it slows down the burning uh, or the um, burning of that fire. So then on the interior, we have the net section, the core of the wood member that continues and is intact and is structurally sound and can withstand the loads that are applied to it. So you're building in this layer of char that can be predicted or calculated uh, to provide fire resistance. This is an example, I mentioned type two construction. We have uh, an analogy for this test that was shown is a glue laminated timber that was exposed to the same amount of fire and time as a steel beam that was unprotected. And you can see that the steel beam lost a lot of its strength and the glue laminated timber beam only lost about 20% of its strength. So it performs very well. This is just another section looking at is if a glue a wood member was supporting a floor system. You design it to be exposed for fire on three sides and the charring occurs. And then we have the cool wood on the inside. And this is covered in uh, chapter 16 that provides mechanically based models supported by empirical data. And it also covers nail laminated timber and glue laminated timber, two other types of mass timber construction. The I mentioned previously about chapter 10 where cross laminated timber had its own adjustment factor table um, as each of the other wood products covered in NDS. Well, the fire design has its own specific adjustment factors, which is shown here. And you can see this, this is a K factor that takes it from, it's an allowable stress design for designing, we don't have LRFD, it's just ASD design, but the K factor takes it to an ultimate strength design when designing for fire. A great resource is technical report TR10, which has recently been updated and provides background and um, on the NDS provisions and design example. So this is, believe it or not, free on the AWC website and has examples for sawn lumber, glue laminated timber, decking, and cross laminated timber, step-by-step -step examples, as well as background on testing, et cetera, and the theory behind it all. Now back to chapter 16, and we have um, an equation that can provide us a method of calculating the char depth. We have A char as far and the A effective, which is the A effective is the depth of the char that we would use for our structural calculations. Um, and then here is the table that applies only to CLT of equal lamination thicknesses. Some manufacturers may have laminations of varying thickness. This table would not work. You'd have to use the equation in the previous slide. But as an example, the actual effective char, if we were calculating for two hours of fire resistance and we had one and three eighths inch laminations, we'd need to build into our cross laminated timber 3.8 inches. And then we use that 
to determine our structural capacity of our wood uh, cross laminated timber. We also have this similar table for glue, uh, sawn lumber, structural glue laminated timber, and, saw, and uh, L structural composite lumber. So the other thing to consider is when we're designing for fire is we need to take into consideration the connections because not only similar when we're designing entire buildings, we don't want to just look at the actual cross laminated timber panel. We want to look at the entire system. And in that, when CLT panels come out, we know that they need to be connected together. And this is an example of a connection of one panel to the other. If um, this was a floor system, the top of the floor would be here. And we need to consider and make sure that no flames pass through that connection or gas pass through that connection. Additionally, we have to look at if the fire starts below here, what happens if the fire occurs and what amount of char is built into the cross laminated timber and how does that affect this connection here? What are we using this connection for? Um, perhaps we're using it for withdrawal for whatever reason. And if the char layer comes up to here, our embedment of our fastener is going to be reduced. So all these things need to be considered when we're connecting, to looking at our connection, looking at the entire system. So uh, we have a provision in chapter 16 that is 16.3 wood connections where fire endurance is required um, for connectors, fasteners, and they're supposed to be the same amount of fire endurance as we design our member for. So now let's look at an actual example of what we're designing for. And I'm a little bit delayed because we had a little glitch at the end. So I may speed through this a little faster than we had wanted because of the problem with the screen sharing uh, on my part. So I apologize if I'm going really fast. Um, but had to do with the technical issue. Okay, so CLT design, what do we need to consider? Um, if you recall, the manufacturing uh, performance base manufacturing standards has to be per ANSI PR, APA PRG 320 to use the provisions in the NDS. And reference design values come from the cross laminated timber manufacturer or the code evaluation report. Not only that, the design section properties need to come from the manufacturer. And this is also stated in chapter 16 that the reduced design section properties uh, and the equations should come from the cross laminated timber manufacturer. So I bring this and I wanna highlight this is because the method that we're gonna show you in the next few slides is an estimate and a simplified approach to give you an idea of what type of cross laminated timber section or panel you would need. Um, to go through it through the NDS, you'd have to get all the information from the manufacturer. It is a proprietary product. But we're showing you this method because it gives you an idea of what, say you're in the schematic phase of your project, you wanna know, can I use CLT? what can, how far can the CLT panel span? And what am I looking at? Am I looking at a three lamb or am I looking at a six lamb? So this is a very good tool to help estimate what you're go going to need for as far as a cross laminated timber. Okay, so the other thing is, is Adam will show you, he, he's, presenting on behalf of CWC, and he'll be look, showing you an example of using the Woodwork software, which is Woodworks from the Canadian Wood Council software. And he'll show you the software and show a demonstration of even fine tuning your design using the software. So our example, uh, this is a similar example to that you would see in TR10, except we've mixed it up a little, not mixed it up, we've added some added value to this design example, and I'll point that out. But anyway, the panel is spanning 18 feet with a strong axis in the long direction, and we have live load of 80 pounds per square feet, uh, dead load of 30, and that includes the estimated self-weight. The decking, uh, we have nail 
decking that prevents from hot gases from passing through the half lap joints. Um, then we also are going to be calculating for two hour of fire resistance, which is quite typical for these type of buildings. Uh, the example in the TR-10 actually does it for one hour. So that's the one difference also. Um, and so that it's calculating the fire resistance when subject to ASTM E119 fire exposure. We're going to be doing it per the NDS 2018, and we're going to also use, instead of the 2017 ANSI PRG tables, we're going to use the 2018 because of the specification and the incorporation of the adhesives for preventing that fire regrowth. Um, the panel connection is using a half lap joint. Now, uh, I'll point this out later, but the, the Woodworks design example actually uses the 2019. And I'll tell you a little of the differences between the two, and Adam can expand upon it when he does his part of the presentation. So right off the bat, we have all our adjustment factors are 1.0. And we determine what our demand on our panels are by just doing the W based on a one foot strip. And we have a 110 pound per linear foot, that's total load. Our V and M, we have our shear, which is WL squared over, I mean WL over two. And then our moment is WL squared over eight. That's pretty simple uh, determination uh, of the shear and the bending moment. And then we're going to use, to determine our design uh, capacities, using the PRG320. Now remember, you should go to the manufacturer, but for this design example, we're going to use the values in the PRG320-2018. There's a table in PRG320 that gives us the ASD reference design values for the laminations, which you see here. And then, and also note that it's also strong, major strong axis and minor strength axis. So it gives us the capacities for two directions, minor and um, minor and uh, major. And then where we draw our capacities from for this design example is in table A2, which is provides us with ASD reference design values for the cross laminated timber panel depending on the thickness and the grade, the CLT layup. Now you'll notice these provides us with the major and minor axis, but one thing I wanna point out is the difference between the 2018 and the 2019 is that the shear, the flat Y shear for the panels it has a certain value, but when we go to the 2019, you'll see a higher increase in strength. And Again, Adam will point this out, but it has to do with when they were developing the 2018 and 2017 standards, I believe goes back to 2017, there was a C factor that was utilized when calculating the capacities of the panels in the CLT handbook. Well, that got carried over to these design standards, um, but it was determined that it wasn't re needed to determine the capacities and it was taken out and they're under, they're evaluating that and it looks like it's going to be incorporated in the 2019. So in anticipation of that incorporation into the 2019, it was incorporated into the Woodwork software. So we have the various layups, E1 through E4 and V1 through V3 that are shown here. Um, e stands for those that had the laminations or the sawn lumber that were made up of E grades of machine rated lumber. There's in the machine rating process, rated lumber processes, there's also some visually grading, but the V represents the visually graded lumber. And you can imagine that you're gonna probably get higher capacities in the E grades as opposed relative to the V grades but the E will probably be a little bit more expensive than the V grades. That's the basic overall high level difference between the two. So let's look at our capacities and what we would see is from the PRG 320 
2018, we chose the V2, which is a seven ply, and the individual laminations are one and three eighths by three and a half inch lumber boards. Um, the overall thickness is nine and five eighths. We pull the information from the table, we get our effective ASD reference flaswise bending, we get our effective flaswise uh, bending stiffness, and our shear stiffness, effective shear stiffness, um, and then we also get our flat wise shear capacity all from that table. So we do a structural capacity check uh, and coming up with taking the 2,490 pound foot per foot width, remember we're doing on a width, one foot width, and find out that our capacity is greater than our demand, so we're good to go. The bending is very similar, so we're good to go on that also. Now, what we also are doing in this design example, which is not in TR10, is checking deflection. And what we have in deflection is we have a deflection and we also have creep. Now, the NDS provides us with a method for determining deflection using CLT panels. What it does not do is provide us with criteria. In other words, we can calculate the deflection, but what do we compare that to to see if we're okay? That is not in the NDS. Um, where we would go to for that deflection criteria is in I, the IBC, and I'll show you that in a minute. But the NDS does require, when we're checking our deflection, we need to also take into account shear deformation. Now, when we're looking at beams, typically like a glue laminate timber beam, shear deformation doesn't have a huge impact on those type of wood products, but it does have an impact on cross laminated timber. So we have to incorporate this shear deformation and one method to, to incorporate that is given in the NDS. Now you can you don't have to use this method to determine the effects of shear deformation. You can use principles of engineering mechanics, which is spelled out. It mentions that in the NDS. This is just one method of determining it. So we have our shear deformation adjustment factor, which is shown here, and that's taken from a table, and it's depending on various things, but one is has to do with how it's connected at the end, what's the end support, and we're assuming this cross laminated timber is pinned. So we have a K sub S of 11.5. There's also a creep factor that we need to take into consideration when we're looking at the deflection and creep, um, which is also in NDS. But we'll come back to that in a minute. So what we need to determine is what are the effects of the shear deformation? And then we come up with an apparent bending stiffness, which is shown here. So we have our EI effective, which comes from the table, and we plug it into the equation. The one thing I should let you know is that the uh, PDF had 106, and I, um, for whatever reason, I keep losing that to the six power, so you might want to check that on your PDF, And um, but it's 10 to the six. So we plug in what we pulled from the table of 898 times 10 to the six into this equation. We also include our shear deformation adjustment factor, which is shown here, and our GA effective, and come up with an apparent bending stiffness of 775 times 10 to the six. And so you can see there is a difference between what was the E effective without shear deformation and what is now incorporating that uh, effects of shear deformation. So to get our criteria on what we measure our, our level of um, deflection is shown in IBC chapter 16. And this we're designing a floor, not a roof although a similar design could be done for a roof. But for this, we're doing a floor design, and we have for short-term load, loading, L over 360. For total load, we have L over 240. And I like to point out this footnote here related to cross-laminated timber, and what can one do to estimate the creep component? If you read through this, um, 
footnote D, it can be make your head spin. But um, for cross laminated timber uh, that is installed under dry conditions, we can estimate the creek component for long term deflection can be estimated using a dead load of just the dead load, 1.0 basically times the dead load to estimate the creep component. Okay, so we plug this all into the equation. We get our criteria from the IBC of the deflection live load, short-term loading of 0.6, and then the total of 0.9. That's what we measure it to. And then we plug everything into our equation for our short-term using the live load of 80 pounds per square foot and using our EI apparent and come up with a 0.244 that's less than 0.60 and we're good to go. So we meet the criteria of the IBC for short-term loading. Then for dead load, we use one times the dead load to determine our creep factor and it's shown here a dead load of 0.092 we plug that into the equation and add it to our short-term loading and get 0.336, which is less than our L over 240, and we're good to go. So we met the criteria of the code. So the deflection limits in the IBC are intended to ensure user comfort and to prevent excessive cracking of plaster and other interior finishes, but you may want to go beyond that. You may want to provide a more less bouncy of floor or perhaps the architect has specified some finishes that have a very stringent criteria beyond what is shown in the IBC. Well there is a method in the NDS that allows you to provide a calculation to take more into effect what happens with creep and that's in the NDS deflection in chapter 3. So I mentioned a creep factor, which is K sub CR, that can be used to calculate this deflection. And so instead of just having 1.0, we put a creep factor, I believe it was 2.0, to determine our creep. So short-term loading, that was similar to what we had previously. So let me go over here. And then here we have it. We have the live uh, 2.0, that's the creep factor, times 0 0.092. And then, then we add that to the short-term loading to come up with 0.428. So that gives you an indication when you're incorporating that creep factor and you can use that to compare it, say if you want to have a stiffer floor than the criteria that's provided in the code or you have some finish requirements. And then now we've done our structural test we'll check, we'll do our fire check. And this is a simplified approach to determining what the capacity is of our cross laminated timber using a fire design in the NDS. And um, I know there's a lot of verbiage here, but uh, I'll show you on the next page because it's better to show with a picture or faster. But our required uh, depth to meet two hours of fire resistance, not a required depth, our amount of char to build into our cross laminated timber based on the table where we have equal lamination so we can use this table and we have two hours of fire resistance, that's what we're required to have. We have one and three eighths inch lamination so we have 3.8 inches needed to build into our cross laminated timber to provide that three, two hours of fire resistance. So we've made uh, some simplifying assumptions and, and it may be a little conservative in that. One, first for a 3.8 inches, remember each of the laminations, excuse me, is one and three eighths. So um, you subtract one of the laminations and that, this is a section looking through the panel and looking this way. And so that's one lamination and that's also two laminations. And then also it partially chars into the other lamination. So our net effect is only about 1.1 inches of lamination left. So we chose to 
not even take that into account, that 1.18 inches. And we're assuming that this other lamination, the weak, uh, the minor axis, does not provide any structural capacity either. So we reduce it down to three laminations. Um, this is, again, a simplified approach and a conservative one, but we can also obtain our estimation of our fire design using the tables in PRG 320 because they have capacities for three laminations of cross laminate timber. So we utilize that using the tables from PRG 320 and base our fire design off of the three laminations. Now Adam, when he does his design example, he's gonna actually use what the net section is. And that's one advantage of using the Woodwork software. So we check our fire design and we use the table, the applicable adjustment factors in chapter 16 and look at the ultimate strength design using that K factor of 2.85 and we get a capacity of 5,785, which is greater than our demand. And we compare it to the loads that we use are the actual loads, the dead load plus live load that was used for our structural design. And um, so we're good to go. And um, I won't get into this because we're running out of time, but just so you know, this thermal separation the premise behind the thermal separation calculation is under ASTM E119, we're required to check to make sure that on, let's just say this is a cross laminated timber panel. The fire starts here and then there could be radiation of heat or heat penetration through the panel. And the other area that's not exposed, it's required to be that the level of uh, temperature doesn't raise more than 250 degrees on the other side of that panel. So that's what this calculation checks is in minutes if it has the amount of minutes required so that you don't get an increase in temperature greater than 250 degrees. So we, I think we're going to uh, skip this since we had a glitch in the beginning no and problem. go ahead and hand it off to Adam. And um, for those of you that wanted the answer, the answer was the last one. So I'll go over, go ahead and hand it to Adam. All right, thanks, Michelle. Hopefully uh, everyone can hear me okay right now and they can see my slides as well. So what I'm going to try and do uh, briefly in the next uh, 10 or so minutes is uh, just to give everyone a brief understanding of the Woodworks Design Office 12 software and specifically this sizer module which um, we've now incorporated uh, cross laminated timber um, as a horizontal beam element or as a vertical uh, gravity load resisting element. So the Woodworks Design Office software has been around since uh, about the, the mid-90s, so it's about 25 years old was the, um, the, the release of the first version. So now we're on version 12, and version 12 is scheduled to be released um, early next month. So the Woodworks uh, software consists of three different modules. The Sizer module, which uh, does gravity design. The Shearwells module, which focuses on lateral design of uh, light frame uh, wood systems. Uh, the connections module um, as well we have a database editor where you can add proprietary products which uh, I'll talk a little bit about how to add uh, CLT uh, products into the database editor. Uh, so for the sizer module we have a concept mode which you can design uh, whole buildings, you can lay out your columns, uh, stud walls, uh, beams, joists, you can apply uh, vertical area loads um, to the system and it, the software will automatically run the loads down the structure and it will design all those horizontal and vertical load resistant elements. Um, within Sizer as well we have the beam mode which I'll focus on today. So within the beam mode you can design uh, beams uh, as well as uh, floor joists and roof joists um, and CLT plates. Uh, and the column mode uh, you can design uh, solids on lumber columns, you can design built up columns, um, SCL columns uh, as well as uh, CLT uh, wall panels. 
Uh, the shear walls module focuses on lateral design, so it has the ability to generate uh, wind and seismic loads uh, according to ASC 7-16. Uh, it also has the ability to distribute these loads uh, within the structure using either the flexible diaphragm approach or the ridges diaphragm approach. Uh, the connections module uh, covers the uh, types of connections um, that are that are listed in the NDS, as well as the types of fasteners, uh, including wood to wood, wood to steel, and wood to concrete uh, connections. Uh, so the Woodwork software, it uh, the most recent version, which is coming out next month, it, it will comply with the IBC 2018, uh, as well as the NDS 2018 standard and uh, the SPIDWIS 2015 uh, version of, of that standard. So here, if we wanted to uh, replicate the CLT floor plate example using the software, um, we could, we see the input screen here. So on the left, uh, we're able to input the span length. Um, the, the software is capable of doing multi-span systems um, with up to six spans. Uh, we can also model cantilevers, either single cantilevers or double cantilevers. Uh, we can also modify the pitch uh, if we have a sloped member. Um, and we can input that here. Uh, as we can see from the bottom um, in the middle here, uh, we can orient the panel either uh, in the longitudinal direction or the transverse direction. So for this specific example, uh, we're going to orient it in the longitudinal direction. We're going to induce bending about the major strength axis. Um, uh, from the pull-down menus on the right side, uh, we can select uh, the type of material uh, as a floor panel and, and CLT. Uh, we have uh, several different types of species uh, that are included as a default uh, within the, the materials database. Um, so for this example, we'll choose spruce pine fir, but we also have option to choose a Douglas fir large or northern species. Uh, and the software also comes with the default uh, grades that are covered in the APA PRG 320 standard. Um, we have the E1, E2, V1, V2, V2 and V3 grades uh, in the software. The user has the ability to specify the depth of the section. Uh, so our, for our example, we choose the nine and five eighths, but we can also leave this as unknown and the software will automatically choose the most efficient section uh, depth uh, for the specified span and loading conditions. Uh, and the, the number of layers will be automatically populated as well based on the, the depth that's chosen. Uh, on the right side, we can see that we have the deflection limits. So here the user has the ability to modify uh, both the live load and the total load deflection limits. And for our example, we're using uh, L over 360 and L over 240. Uh, the checkbox on the right uh, also allows the user to specify a maximum absolute value for deflection uh, if, if they sort of choose to. So here in this slide, we can see that uh, these are all the inputs um, that we have for the, 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 the CLT design. Uh, on the right, we have a bearing design. Uh, so the software is able to perform bearing design for both the uh, supported member and the supporting member. Uh, we can apply uh, different uh, support conditions to uh, different ends of, of, a, of a beam, um, either uh, bearing uh, at the left end is different than the right end. Uh, we have different types of bearing supports. Uh, we have a, a hanger option, um, non-wood option, so if a CLT is supported on a concrete wall or masonry wall, we can deal with that. Uh, a wooden sill plate, a beam, uh, if the CLT is supported on a stud wall, uh, we can model that as well. Uh, and uh, if it's supported on another CLT uh, vertical element, uh, that's an option in the software as well. We can see here uh, the bearing support for different types of materials. We have um, all sorts of uh, different types of, of materials that are defined in the NDS, uh, um, timbers as well as uh, dimensional lumber, glue lamb, um, and LVL and MEL and MSR uh, lumber products, uh, different species uh, that are again defined uh, with their specific material properties in the NDS and the different grades um, that are uh, associated with those um, species and materials. Once we've defined um, those uh, inputs on the first screen, we can then go and we can uh, add our loads to the uh, to the CLT. In this case, we have uh, a dead load of 30 PSF and a live load of uh, 80 PSF. Uh, we have different types of loads uh, that we can define in the software, uh, dead, live, snow, etc., uh, as well as different uh, load distributions. Uh, for this one, we're using uh, sort of a, a typical uniform area load, but we can also apply uh, partial area loads, triangular, trapezoidal uh, point loads, and, and applied moments as well. 
So once we apply the loads, uh, the software will uh, automatically generate uh, analysis diagrams for us. Uh, so we have uh, our shear diagrams, our bending moment diagrams, as well as deflection diagrams. And each of these analysis diagrams will be generated for all the different load combinations. So when we run the analysis, uh, we would see something uh, similar to, uh, to this output. Um, at the top, we have an echo of the inputs. So um, this is the SCLT floor plan panel of V2 grade um, of a 9 and 5 eighths depth. Uh, we have what the panel orientation is uh, as well. Uh, right at the, at the up front and center, we can see if the design uh, passes or fails the code checks. Uh, so if we look closer at the analysis versus allowable stress uh, table, we can see here uh, what is the applied uh, shear and the applied uh, moments that we're generating, um, as well as what is the allowable uh, shear and the allowable moment. Uh, you'll notice here that the allowable shear value uh, is actually uh, higher in, that in the software than uh, what uh, Michelle has showed in the calculation, and that's because uh, the software is using those uh, higher shear values that have now, uh, that will soon be implemented into the APA PRG 320 standard, uh, the 2019 version, which is uh, scheduled to be released um, shortly uh, later this year. Uh, as well, on the right-hand side, we can see the software is generating a critical response, so it's taking uh, the applied load um, divided by the allowable, and uh, we can see for our shear, we're at about 26% capacity and moment 54% uh, capacity for this specific design. Uh, below the shear and bending, we can see what our deflections are. We, we've, uh, the software's going to automatically calculate uh, what is our uh, actual live load and total load deflection and compare that uh, to the deflection limits that we've specified. Here we can see as well um, some additional information that the software is providing. Um, if we look below the analysis and allowable design table, we see some additional data. Uh, here's where we have all of the allowable stress uh, values for um, uh, shear bending uh, and all of the modification factors. So the user can go back and check to make sure that uh, they're in agreement with the uh, load duration, the moisture factor, the temperature factor uh, that the software is calculating. Um, as well, at the very bottom, uh, we can see that the, we've uh, output some of the uh, suction properties for the calculations. So um, the effective suction modulus, as well as the effective stiffness uh, and the GA effective value that the software is using for the calculations. And this is uh, going to provide transparency and allow the user again to back check uh, any of those calculations that they wish to. Here's an example of the bearing design summary. Um, so we can see the software is calculating the capacity, uh, the bearing capacity of the beam itself, as well as the bearing capacity of the support. Um, and it's calculating the minimum uh, required bearing length uh, for each of the support locations. In the input screen, we also have the option of doing a fire design. So for our specific example, we can choose um, a two hour uh, fire required fire resistance. Uh, also have the option for one or one and a half hour resistance. Um, different protection options. For our example, we don't have any protection, but we can apply uh, either one layer or two layer layers of uh, 5 8 uh, gypsum board. And as well, we can specify uh, the number of sides that are exposed uh, of the CLT, whether it's top and bottom or, or just bottom uh, in our case. So we, we start the fire design, obviously, using uh, the full section size. So in our case, we have a seven-ply uh, system. Uh, and the, the, the software is going to calculate the fire design um, based on uh, not the simplified method, method, but what's called the cross-sectional method, and this is defined uh, under Chapter 16 of the NDS 2018. Uh, and we're also uh, using information from the TR10 uh, publication by the American Wood Council as well. Uh, so the, the software is going to use the equations in NDS Chapter 16. Um, it's also going to neglect any uh, layer of the CLT that has a partial char um, uh, that's, that's in the layer. So uh, it will neglect the contribution of that partially charred layer, and it will also neglect the contribution of the adjacent layer if it's a transverse layer. Uh, call that the zero strength layer. So those are some of the assumptions that um, the software is working under as well. 
so here we can see uh, the outputs for the fire design um, in the top uh, analysis versus allowable stress table. We have the applied moment, um, and then we have the allowable uh, moment uh, under the fire conditions. So in this case here, the governing design criteria for our example is actually uh, the bending under the fire scenario at about 65% capacity. Uh, if we look down at the very bottom of this table, we can see some of the outputs um, as well. What is the residual section? Uh, what is the EI effective that the software is using? Uh, as well as the GA effective and some of the adjustment factors for the fire design, again, to provide transparency to the, to the user. In addition to uh, structural design and fire design, the software also has the ability to perform a vibration design. Um, this is uh, a non-mandatory procedure. It's not required to perform uh, this type of a serviceability related design in the US codes, uh, but we have included it because of the fact that um, there is guidance around vibration uh, design procedure in Canada. We take the procedure from the CSA OD6 2014 version, uh, update number one, and you can see from this equation, uh, we're we're calculating uh, empirically a, a vibration controlled span limit uh, based on the effective bending stiffness and the mass of the CLT. Uh, so within the software, the user has the ability to either turn the vibration design on or off. Um, and if you want more information about uh, how the vibration design is being performed, you can refer uh, to the, the uh, CSA OD6 uh, document as well as the commentary uh, to the CSA OD6 for additional information which um, and assumptions around this procedure, which uh, is, is included in the uh, wood design manual that's uh, published by the Canadian Wood Council. So here uh, we can uh, briefly see what is the, uh, the vibration uh, limits uh, here and, and the output. And quickly, we can go through uh, what is, uh, you know, the software provides easily, uh, how we can uh, develop a maximum span. If we simply um, run a few different scenarios, we can see for this specific example, we have a maximum span of about uh, 22 feet based on the, the loading conditions. Uh, again, with the fire uh, bending as the governing design criteria. Uh, again, the software allows us to easily uh, calculate what is our maximum uh, loading conditions. So if we uh, increase our live loads, uh, we can see we uh, max out at about 135 uh, pounds per square foot. Per square foot. Um, and uh, again, the governing design criteria is uh, bending in under the fire design. So briefly, I want to just say that you can input um, different types of CLT. Um, it's a proprietary product, so different manufacturers have uh, different types of panels. Uh, the database editor um, comes with the defaults of uh, three different species and five different grades and different section sizes, um, but the user can then uh, create custom uh, CLT panels. Uh, you can also create custom uh, structural composite lumber and uh, I-joists, uh, wooden I-joists as well. Uh, so the user could actually go in, uh, can create a new species. So in, 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 for instance, if you had CLT out of southern pine, you could add that as a species uh, with a specific uh, density. Um, as well, you can uh, add different grades uh, of the CLT. You can modify uh, the uh, allowable stress properties for bending, for compression, um, and you can input those uh, as custom based on the manufacturer. Um, you can also input uh, different section sizes if manufacturers have are using different numbers of layups, or using different sizes of layups. Uh, you can input that in, in this uh, database editor, uh, as well as the ability to actually put double parallel layers uh, on the outermost um, uh, reaches of the CLT panel. So we have a, a quiz here, um, poll question. We sure do. So the woodwork software performs which of the following designs? Vibration design, structural design, fire design, all of the above, or answers B and C only? All righty. And again, I'm going to go quickly, but it really, this does not matter for your certificates. So, um, 84% say all of the above. So what do you say, Adam? 
Yeah, exactly. Glad to hear everyone was listening. Uh, we do do the structural in the fire, which are covered under NDS 2018, and we also have the optional uh, non-mandatory vibration design uh, that comes from the Canadian um, Engineering Design and Wood Standard. I'll pass it back over to Michelle for the last uh, little section here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Adam. That was very informative. So I'm going to run through this last part pretty quickly and um, so we can have some time for questions in three minutes. Actually, if you can stay on, you'll, um, that'd be great. But uh, the, um, what's going on in the industry net right now is very exciting and especially with the, seeing more and more of mass timber type projects that are being being built out in the country and the world. And we did a webinar back in June of 2018 that was titled Outcomes of ICC Tall Wood Ad Hoc Committee Proposals and Discussions. That's available on our website and I'll go quickly through what has recently been occurring regarding the 2021 code. And what you see, we'll be talking about mass timber as opposed to conventional frame construction. Um, mass timber is that with large uh, or solid wood construction, not stick frame construction, nor is it uh, traditional heavy timber construction. And as I mentioned in the 2021 code, there's a code change for defining mass timber construction. But back in 2015, December 2015, a ICC ad hoc committee on tall wood buildings was formed and was created using various stakeholders related to looking at mass timber and tall wood construction. And they looked at tons and tons of research and testing that has been performed and looked at performance criteria for incorporating mass timber construction and to build with this type of construction to higher heights. And part of that research was to do a fire test. We have, um, this is incorporated into the webinar, but there was, as I mentioned, performance criteria that was provided by the committee based on the research that they had formed and based on the knowledge that was, there was a lot of experts on that committee. And um, you can see a mock-up of the test that, test that was uh, done, uh, of their test specimen, it's a big, anyway, and a full-size cross laminate timber building. They did five tests and the cross laminate timber building performed really well. And out of that came the 14 tall mass timber code changes that are listed here. And as a result of that, and I'll, let me see, there's a slide in here. Um, this is the process that went through. Code changes were submitted in January. It went to committee action hearings and it was passed. The 14 code, code changes were passed almost unanimously with one dissenter. That means that it moved uh, on uh, to public comment and public hearings and then there was public comment hearings in October and from there it was passed and then it went to online voting. And as a result of that, um, we recently heard in December that all 14 code changes were perform were approved. Um, what you will see is in addition to the traditional heavy timber construction, we will now see in the 2021 code three types of heavy timber construction that is type 4C, type 4B, type 4A, all with various uh, criteria. The type 4C you can go to 85 feet, nine stories, where the cross uh, mass timber can be fully exposed. And then type 4B again with partially exposed uh, mass timber and going to 12 stories and 180 feet. And then for the more uh, sprinklers and fully protected mass timber, we can go up to 18 stories and 270 feet. And there was a summation of these comparison, comparing the different type constructions on the AWC website if you'd like more information. And um, so we're very happy. There was a lot of hard work by the AW staff, AWC staff to support this effort, especially our field staff. 
And um, so there was an announcement in October when the code hearings, the public comment hearings, that um, the word came out that it moved forward and was approved uh, to and move forward to the online voting. And uh, I mentioned the webinar, the recorded webinar is available on our website and you can watch it for free at your leisure. We had Sam Francis and Paul Coates present that webinar. And even before the code changes were approved, we uh, saw that other areas of the country were looking at adopting it. One of them being specifically Oregon, the state of Oregon, which adopted it, all 14 code changes before it was even adopted into the IBC. And then um, this is the same map that I showed earlier where it gives you some samplings of mass timber construction that's going around, going on or has been built throughout the nation. And Woodworks has a really good map um, that provides you the link to their website that shows you, gives you a flavor of the construction that's going out throughout the nation for those projects that are in design or construction is as started because we've gotten questions of how prevalent is this type of construction? Am I too late to get on the boat? Well, no, you're not too late. It, we would support you in that effort and um, provide you education. Woodworks provides one-on-one -on -one assistance on projects, so they are a very good resource for those that are needing assistance on specific projects. So I wanted to end up the webinar with um, some when I, um, what's going on throughout the nation and um, also show you a sample of a project. I was in Chicago where there was a McDonald's and I was walking around sh Chicago where I didn't expect cross laminated timber to be and lo and behold there was a McDonald's that was under construction and this was last year and I believe it's completed now but they used glue laminated timber beams and cross laminated timber uh, panels for the roof system. And if you want more information, we have a web page dedicated to tall wood construction. There is also a nail laminated timber publication that's available that's where nail laminated timber, it was actually, it's under mechanically laminated timber in the code and it's been in the code for quite some time back to I know at least 1967 UVC and this provides some guidance on utilizing nail laminated timber in design and construction and then there's also a publication for cross laminated timber using it for horizontal diaphragms that's available and we have our uh, publications all of our or the majority of our publications are available and our standards are available. There is electronic versions available for free. If you want an electronic PDF that can be printed, that has to be purchased and the hard copies are purchased, but certainly the electronic version that you can see on your cell phone, tablet, et cetera, are available for free without the commentary. Um, for, so the 2018 NDS is available for purchase and um, one clarification or point to make out is the wind and seismic provisions were not updated or, or any revisions were made. So the, the 2018 IBC references the 2015 wind and seismic provisions. There's articles available to get into more detail about the overview of the code changes. And one thing I want to point out is that we are going to have a webinar on cross laminated timber wall design and there is a wall design in the TR10 that you can look at as well. Um, so we do have um, education available for live presentations that's available. There's on our education tab and I just want to point out that when we showed you the map of the areas of the country, we have field staff that are shown here in each of those areas of the country. And their concentration is in particular related to code officials. So if you're code official, they are a really great resource if you have questions related to wood construction and especially related to mass timber construction. And then we provide education, live presentations, 
here's the main speakers with Buddy as our VP of Tech Transfer, myself, I'm in the middle, and then Lori Cook, who is our powerhouse educator as well. Okay, so let me make sure, okay, there we go. So I want to shift to the next screen so that Adam can uh, just uh, mention availability and discounts. Thanks, Michelle. So just to let everyone know, you can get more information um, from the contacts here. Uh, also on the Woodworks website, you can download um, a free copy of the software, uh, so a demonstration version. Uh, just to let you know that uh, AWC members do get 10% um, discount using this promo code and the software is available for free to uh, building officials as well as to educators. Uh, so lots more information on the Woodworks website, woodworks-software.com. Thank you. Great. Lori, do you want to, uh, let's have a, just a few questions. Yeah, we have, we have a lot of questions. So um, uh, Adam, we did have a couple of questions come in on Woodworks, um, if uh, I think you may have mentioned it, but when can we expect uh, version 12 of the Woodworks software to be available? So we're we're at probably about 99% of development now, and we're expecting to release it uh, early next month, uh, so early February 2019. Um, we'll see the Woodworks version 12, which will include CLT. Um, some other features that may be of interest to people in the new uh, upcoming version, uh, we've incorporated um, hangers uh, from the Simpson Strong Tie uh, catalog. So uh, users can simply select a hanger, beam hanger, joist hanger, um, and the software will automatically check uh, the factored reaction against the hanger capacity. Um, so it makes it quite easy to choose and design hangers um, using the software as well. Um, additionally, we've complying with all of the updates to the NDS 2018, the IBC 2018, um, as well uh, as uh, compliance with the ASC 7-16. Okay, great. One uh, other question on the software that came in. Um, if you're doing a, a design in um, the the software and you're specifying um, some gypsum sheathing on the outside of your of your wall assembly uh, is are you able to specify type X gypsum which would be you know the, the fire rated material or um, do you have the ability to specify different materials for your wall coverings uh, so f for the sizer example that I showed, um, the assumption is that um, we have uh, always a type X, uh, 5 8 gypsum, either one layer or two layers um, is the, the, the available options that we list for the sizer uh, software right now. And, and um, uh, perhaps uh, m maybe Michelle or yourself, you have uh, more information on other applicable types, but I know that those are the most common um, uh, fire resistant uh, coverings that we, we're seeing on CLT. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. All right, Michelle, we had uh, a few questions that came in for you. Um, one question was related to why did we, uh, in our design example, not use the ASC7 Extraordinary Events uh, load combination for fire? Well, that's a very good question. And um, one thing to note is that we are doing the design to meet the ASTM E119 criteria, and that criteria does not require us to look at the that uh, the extraordinary events. We use the total dead load the, that is applied for the design. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we had several questions come in related to um, the. NDS Chapter 16.3 related to fire protection of wood connections. So I thought perhaps we could discuss this a little bit further. Sure. Um, I know that you had a slide that that discussed, uh, you know, the protection requirements for um, Chapter 16. Uh, one of the important things I think that was added in in 2018 that we may not have emphasized enough was that. Uh, you know, it's important to protect the the connection, you know, the hardware itself, but also mm -hmm. uh, the portions of the wood members that are included in the connection design um, need to be protected as well. So, 
Um, that's something that, that was uh, emphasized, I think, in, in the 2018 NDS. So if we're connect, this is not probably the best examples, um, but if this cross laminated timber is being designed for exposure to fire and it's going to char, we need to make sure that we have enough capacity in the connector to meet the requirements structurally even though it's exposed to fire or we protect it completely with um, wood or gypsum so that you don't have to take, a, take into account the subtraction of the wood when it chars. But it's all making sure that you look at structurally and also the fire design. There's some details also in TR10 that looks at connections and it gives more information related to protecting the connection. But yes, we want to protect that connection so after in the event of a fire, it has the capacity to withstand that fire and still be structurally sound, including the metal connections. Hopefully that okay. can be. Yeah, that's good. Um, all right. Let's take one more question. We're coming up on a quarter till the, the hour here. Um, there's been a lot of questions on acoustics uh, of CLT assemblies. I know we didn't touch on that today, but perhaps you can just comment on some typical assemblies in, in some of the structures you've seen, uh, you know, related to floor assemblies and how they address sound transmission. Oh, that's a good one. The, um, well, Jason's done that. Do you want to mention about Jason doing the research on um, acoustic sound transmission? Yes. Yeah, we, we do have a new report on sound transmission uh, on our website. Um, but I, I know a lot of the structures I've seen out there have done, uh, you know, concrete topping slabs. Correct. They um, Or they have some type of proprietary uh, membrane in there that also helps with sound transmission. And um, but and, and a lot of them you're going to see exposed also. So you've got to check the top of the um, where the sound would transmit through the top. I'm I'm not really an expert in sound transmission, but right. um, I know there there is um, software out there that uh, AWC has developed related to sound transmission. And uh, the the new document we've just developed uh, is Technical Report 15 or TR15. You can download that on our website uh, in the Publications tab there. Which is this one right here, Sound Transmission. Yep, it's a TR free 15. download. Yes. So. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's uh, that takes us past a, a quarter till. So let's. Uh, wrap up uh, I'd like to thank everybody for for attending today and uh, Michelle and Adam if you have any closing remarks just like to thank everyone as well and uh, hopefully it was it was valuable for everyone to listen in today thank you yes uh, thank you for joining us and thank uh, CWC and Adam for contributing to this webinar hopefully we've provided some valuable information thanks everyone we hope you have a great day